Welcome to the podcast series titled Global Resilience for National Cybersecurity, Strengthening the Interconnections Among Actors. This is Greta Nasi, co-director of the Master of Science in Cyber Risk Strategy and Governance, jointly offered by Bocconi University and Polytechnic of Milan. Together with Professor MacArthur, a joint professor at Bocconi, we discuss with our guests key topics on the role of government and cybersecurity. This project was made possible thanks to a grant from the U.S. Mission to Italy, and it holds the patronage of the Italian Parliamentary Anti-Mafia Commission. Welcome to this podcast, which is titled State Security and Cyber War. The topics of cybersecurity, state security, and cyber war are quite central in today's world. Thus, their definitions are not unique and they are different in different territorial contexts and disciplines. Cybersecurity, for example, is not just a technical capacity to ensure the safety of computers and networks of systems, but it is also the political, legal, social, and economic capacity to ensure the safe, inclusive, and sustainable well-being of individuals and the prosperity of organizations and states. So we can depict cybersecurity as a set of means not only of protecting and defending society and its essential information infrastructures, but also a way of prosecuting national and international policies through information technological means. Security is very much tied to state security as the capacity of a state to protect and defend its citizenry. Thus, the internet is transnational by definition, and it's mainly operated by the private sector actors that govern the hardware and the software. So state actors have little control over cyberspace, thus its impact on human rights, the well-being of individuals, firms' competitiveness, and democracy is massive. This requires a new realm and governance of state security that will be discussed in this podcast. Finally, cyber war traditionally relates to the physical security of people and attacks on critical infrastructures. But its actual meaning depends on the standpoints of the actors involved. As it is based on the internet and the information infrastructure, it is again a concept that it's transnational by definition. And it requires first a deep understanding of its roots and meaning, and then the adaption and innovations to the rules, governance, instruments, and agencies that deal with it to ensure that state objectives are met. This podcast hosts the viewpoint of several actors involved in this field. You will hear from Andrea Calderaro, professor at the University of Cardiff and Robert Schumann Center Fellow at the European University Institute, Colin MacArthur, a John professor at Università Bocconi, Fabiana Sofia Pereira, professor at the William Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the National Defense University. Elisa Pisanelli, PhD candidate at the European University Institute and research assistant at the Center on Cybersecurity and Digitalization at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. And Raffaele Volpi, strategic advisor and geopolitical analyst, former chairman of the Italian Parliamentary Commission for Security. Elisa Pisanelli is a PhD candidate at the European University Institute and Center on Cybersecurity and Digitalization at the International Institute of Political Studies. Elisa, what are the emerging trends in state security and how do cybersecurity strategies impact state security? Okay, so first, thank you so much for having me here today. And to address your question, uh, let me first uh, take a step back and uh, repeat what are the three main uh, key um, determinants uh, that uh, nations should address when facing cyber attacks and cyber wars. So the first one are threats. So who is attacking? Is the attack coming from a nation, from individuals, from terroristic groups? Uh, the second one uh, um, relies on the impact of cyber attacks. So 
are there is social, social impact, economic impact, political impact? And the third one uh, uh, relies on uh, weaknesses within the ICT system of the nation. So what are the main um, aspects where nations can be attacked in a cyber world? Uh, so what happens uh, when we think about how nation develop their strategies to address cyber wars is that uh, the main objective of national strategies are uh, strengthening the ICT system to avoid weaknesses that can be attacked, um, reduce potential uh, impact of the cyber attacks, and reduce threat, um, risks of these attacks, so threats. Um, when we think about trends in national strategies worldwide, the first key example comes from the United States. Mainly what's happening there is that uh, the low federal states are adapting to changes in ICT. So this means that uh, laws uh, cannot uh, keep being the same one over time, but should address changes in the cyber environment. Um, for doing this, Ba mainly the US, but not just the US, uh, it's something we are observing worldwide, um, are trying to develop partnership with, pri with the private sector. So what's happening is that there is a free flow of information between the private and the public uh, to try to address potential arms caused by cyber attacks. Uh, the second thing, is uh, that when we think about national strategies, we can not only think about public-private cooperation, but also about international cooperation. So um, if we think about cyber wars, it is very important to um, take in mind the fact that uh, cyber wars are not conventional wars. So the battlefield is not physical, there is no soldier in the, in the field that is fighting. But uh, when a cyber attack is um, launched or when mis misinformation is spread, this can exceed national boundaries and can have profound implications internationally. So what happens is that when countries uh, need to develop strategies to fight against cyber, war, cyber attacks, um, they cooperate internationally and they align international strategies uh, to make a compact front. And this brings me uh, to the example of uh, the Ukrainian war. Uh, so when Russia uh, performs, undertakes cyber attacks to, um, against Ukraine, what uh, happens is that uh, these cyber attacks may have uh, impacts uh, on uh, other Western countries, because uh, those Western countries uh, are linked to Ukraine in political and economic terms. And last, I would like to conclude with a policy advice. So um, as we are seeing uh, with the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, the meaning attached to cybersecurity and to cyber war differ accordingly to different nations. Uh, so, for example, uh, Russia, when uh, relies on cyber wars, uh, makes of narrative its key point. So the idea is that uh, Russia adopts as a key strategy uh, the um, spread of information, which is sometimes misinformation, to maintain people's support for the war. Uh, on the other side, when we think about the Western world, um, the meaning attached to cyber wars and cyber security relates to physical security of people that are not harmed by cyber attacks and of infrastructures. So attacks that destroy ICT infrastructures. Uh, so this is a key point because, uh, for example, if the Western world wants to help Ukraine in defending itself from uh, cyber attacks from Russia, um, then uh, this means that uh, the Western countries need to take in mind that it is not only necessary to strengthen um, agencies and infrastructures, but and intelligence, of course, but also to uh, provide tools to Ukraine uh, for maintaining and supporting independent information providers and social networks. 
Andrea Calderaro is a professor at the University of Cardiff and a Robert Schumann Center Fellow at the European University Institute. Professor Calderaro, what is the impact of the changes in cybersecurity in the Global South? How is it manifesting there? Thank you, Colin, for, for the question. I'm going to answer this question by emphasizing three key points. First of all, I would like to emphasize on how transnational is the internet infrastructure, um, how uh, important, what are the implications for international cooperation due to the uh, transnational nature of the internet infrastructure, and of course, third, answering your question, what are the implications for the global south? So when it comes to uh, the uh, transnational nature of the internet infrastructure, I think it's always very important to remind ourselves that the internet is uh, is made of uh, internet submarine cables laying in international seawaters, and uh, which is a uh, decision taken exactly not to to ensure that the functioning of the internet is not bothered by national legislation and uh, and, uh, and national cybersecurity priorities. The, uh, the internet is therefore transnational when it comes to its hardware, but it's transnational also when it comes to its software because the routing of data is really um, doesn't care about national borders, doesn't care about national legislation, but the routing of data happens because of technical um, negotiations, because of technical protocols negotiated by the technical communities that find solutions in order to ensure the functioning of the internet in the best ways possible. So the, um, this internet infrastructure connects cloud services, and cloud services is also very important to remind ourselves, consists of hard drives that are randomly, well, not very randomly, but anyway distributed worldwide, uh, regardless of the citizenships of the data owners. So this, of course, uh, is, uh, it's, uh, brings our conversations, could bring our, uh, our conversation in a variety of directions. But when it comes to the cybersecurity domain, this means that state actors do have very little control over the functioning of the internet because the internet infrastructure is built, managed uh, by private actors that lay the cables, manage the internet infrastructures, and manage the cloud services, and of course, digital services, as we all well know. So. What does it mean then for the in international cooperation? First of all, it means that it's of course it's very important to um, keep discussing, ensuring that each country do, does have the um, capacity to manage their own national uh, infrastructure, to design the cyber capabilities, but it's also very important to protect the internet as a whole. And this means that uh, we need to increasingly engage international cooperation in cyber domain to identify forms of governance that makes this transnational, uh, gover transnational governance approach to the cyber security domain inclusive of and represent all the variety of actors that are involved in the functioning of the internet. So when it comes to uh, the Global South, uh, if we uh, believe that we really need to uh, enhance a transnational governance approach in the cyber domain, this also means that we need to ensure that countries in the Global South do have an active role in this uh, uh, daily global conversation. We need to remind ourselves that most of the internet users do not live in this side of the world any longer. Most of the internet users actually are based in the global south. It has been estimated that by 2025, 75% of the internet users will be located in the global south. And the transnational governance approach on cybersecurity really needs to reflect this uh, uh, changes in the internet population. So the recent developments in the in the in the internet population. So. This means that countries in the global south not only needs to develop their cyber capabilities in order to again contribute to this transnational protection of the of the of the internet infrastructure, but also they need to uh, have the capacity to engage in uh, this uh, uh, international cooperation on, on over over the cybersecurity domain. We also need to um, remind ourselves, I mean, as I mentioned, the internet infrastructure is managed by uh, private actors. And this means that state actors also need to increasingly engage with, uh, with industry that do have the responsibility to uh, build, manage, and protect the infrastructure. But also they need to engage with civil society 
because also civil society is very increasingly relevant for ensuring the protection of, 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 of the cyber domain. So this means that the security of cyber domain is a shared responsibility and this needs to be reflected somehow in a variety of efforts that we increasingly witness when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to the governance of the, of the cyber domain. Fabiana, to tell us a little bit about uh, what is the current perspective in cybersecurity from you know, your standpoint, so moving from the defense studies into the global geopolitical situation. The first thing I want to highlight is that Latin America is characterized by stark differences in state capacity. And here I'm understanding state capacity from a barbarian conception as a community of people having monopoly over the use of force in a given territory. This means that in Latin America, there are a number of countries that whose security or defense sectors, some countries don't have defense sectors, as you know, are unable to project power all the way to the border. So if the, in a state that is physically unable to hold power over the first domain, the land domain, one can imagine the difficulties in projecting that power to other domains, to sea, to air, and especially to cyber. So when we're looking at Latin America, this is really the first challenge that we're facing is that there are stark differences in state capacity. Not to say that all of Latin America is in a dire situation. Like I said, the, the point I want to highlight is differences. We go all the way from, let's say, Chile on the one end, a country that's a member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So by all measures, an advanced country, all the way to Haiti on the other side, which is the first instance that comes to mind when one thinks of state failure. Certainly when uh, one lives in the side of the world that I live in. Um, so when we approach, when we start to consider securing the cyber domain, the first thing we have to consider is that there's gonna be very big differences in Latin America in the way that it can use a security and defense apparatus um, to secure and also project power in the cyber domain. I was also asked to address specifically the issue of hyperconnectedness, which was very interesting to me in the context of the region. In the context of Latin America, hyperconnectedness means that the region is more exposed than ever to other countries, understanding other countries as extra regional countries. So as the world has become more connected, Latin America has become more open to the outside world. Another way to think about this is that the connections that Latin America had let's say in the 1980s and 90s through trade and investment are now mirrored in the cyber domain and they're mostly connections toward outside of the region. Latin America is very well connected to the three principal extra regional actors vying for space. That would be the United States, of course, uh, Russia and China. However, when we look within the region, the region remains very poorly connected. So that when we consider an example like the one that framed the workshop about a cyber attack spilling over to a neighbor, the chances of that happening in Latin America are going to be reduced because of the very, very weak connections within the neighbors. So if you think about, if you can conjure up a map of South America in your mind, I invite you to think about the countries as all facing out so that they're back to back rather than looking in toward each other's. That's the way that Latin America is organized. Everybody's looking out to the Atlantic, to the Pacific, or north to the United States. In very few countries on very few issues are looking in. So when we think about hyperconnectedness, it's not hyperconnectedness within the region, uh, but rather outside. I tried to find an example to kind of bring this to light, um, or to yeah, to put this in more accessible terms. So I looked, for example, at flights between the capital of Colombia, Bogota, and Miami. Ten different airlines offer that flight nonstop. You can fly today at any point in the day. When you look at flights between Bogota and Sao Paulo, the most important city in Brazil, we're looking at only four airlines. If you look at a connection between the capitals of the two countries that are neighbors, it's nearly impossible for a person to fly from one country to another country. Uh, consider from your location instead how many places uh, you can get to. So, in this case, we would be talking when we think about state security in the hyperconnected context of Latin America specifically, we're looking, security would really mean uh, having a strong and coherent national security, national defense policy, and the knowledge and expertise, including intelligence capabilities, to be able to execute it. 
the state has to understand the nature of the various actors that it is engaging with and have the possibility of opening the door to those actors or closing it depending on what it perceives as their intentions. The challenge here, of course, is that actors don't always present their clear face and that the people in, in government might have different reasons um, for aligning with one actor over another. But ultimately, state security for Latin America is going to depend on understanding the different intentions of the three key competitors and being selective on who it chooses to engage with. This is really coming to a head when we consider the case of uh, the provision of 5G networks, um, where we're seeing kind of an interesting micro case study. Uh, so initially, in the case of Ecuador, they had initially committed to exploring a Chinese uh, PRC competitor for the provision of 5G networks and had gone some ways down that road when the United States decided that it was indeed interested in competing for Ecuador and put forth its own bid that included more than $2 billion for Ecuador to pay back China to get out of that commitment. When we look at this, we see very clearly two competitors vying for the same critical infrastructure in Latin America and perhaps a knowledge gap on the part of the receiving country or, or a misalignment of the government's um, goals versus what should be the goals of the state in pursuing one option over a different option. A 5G network in Ecuador could have repercussions beyond the borders of Ecuador, but it's that would be rare. Latin America as a region, like I said, it's very weakly connected. Um, this is shown in part, and here I want to transition to the last part that I was asked to address on cyber war. Uh, Latin America's poor interregional connections also mean that it has very seldom gone to interstate war. So there is a silver lining to not talking to your neighbors is that you cannot disagree with them. The last interstate war in Latin America was, of course, the 1982 uh, war in the South Atlantic, which involved an extra regional actor. Prior to that, the region hadn't gone to war to countries within the region since 1935 in the Chaco Wars, um, also in the Southern Cone. So when one thinks about the idea of cyber war, I almost want to push back against the use of the word war because it's a nearly foreign concept um, for Latin America, which is a lot more, has a lot more experience in dealing with low intensity conflict. That said, uh, we did recently, Latin America did this year, experience an instance that one of its countries called the war, and that was the attack, the cyber attack against the Costa Rican social security system. At that time, the government of Costa Rica did call the attack a war, which was an interesting choice of words, considering that Costa Rica really lacked the capacity to respond uh, in a way that I would consider central to the concept of war. In my opinion, in the case of Latin America, cyber war is unlikely because I would imagine war, including two belligerent, two belligerents, where one has at least a chance of responding somehow. Latin America, as it is right now, is very vulnerable. It is susceptible to an attack, but not susceptible to having kind of a back and forth in the cyber domain because of the state, uh, the weakness of the state, which is mirrored in the weakness of the state capacity in the cyber domain. This interview has been recorded in Italian, and a short English summary follows it. Raffaele Volpi is a geopolitical strategist, and he's also the former chairman of the Italian Parliamentary Commission for Security. Raffaele, what does state security mean in the context of Italy? Is the current geopolitical situation affecting their principles? Negli ultimi anni è cambiato profondamente il contesto di riferimento di sicurezza nazionale. Si è passati dall'idea del secolo scorso dove l'interesse nazionale e la sicurezza nazionale erano racchiusi all'interno dei confini statuali e oggi si è arrivati invece a un'idea di interesse nazionale, quindi la declinazione di sicurezza nazionale che non è più legata ai confini ma possono essere interessi che sono eh, in qualunque luogo del mondo. È ovvio anche che con il passaggio rispetto alle nuove tecnologie si è passate da un sistema di verifica su, su situazioni materiali a situazioni immateriali. 
certamente in questo momento il contesto italiano che è centrale nel Mediterraneo con un'Italia che eh, forse in maniera un po' più timida ha smesso di guardare il suo punto di riferimento che era il Mediterraneo allargato e il nuovo contesto di presenza di un conflitto quasi da secolo scorso eh, che è quello dell'Ucraina ci mettono in condizioni di riguardare in maniera eh, più ampia quello che è il concetto di sicurezza ma anche il concetto di alleanze la Nato sta facendo una profonda riflessione su quello che è il suo spirito di partecipazione diretto e degli stati che ne fanno parte passando sempre di più da un'idea di alleanza militare a un'idea di alleanza politica si è partiti con l'Afghanistan che era sicuramente un teatro non immediatamente naturale per l'alleanza atlantica e oggi ci si trova a fronte di un conflitto vero e proprio che è alle porte della Nato. Questo deve consentire a tutti i partecipanti per una riflessione profondissima di quelle che sono le nature valoriali e non solo politiche del riferimento di contesto. L'Italia è centrale, sì l'Italia è centrale perché indubbiamente un fronte sud delle alleanze vuol dire guardare a mezzi, sistemi, tecnologie e forme di partecipazione che non sono quelle del sistema continentale, guardare al Nord Africa o al Centro Africa che sono eh, sicuramente punti centrali anche per l'avanzata economica cinese riguardo agli interessi economici vuol dire saper partecipare a eh, un contesto non semplice di teatri che sono sicuramente diversi da quelli a cui ci si era abituati. Penso che la trasformazione non solo tecnologica ma anche di postura e quindi complessivamente riguardante tutto il sistema dalla forma eh, di diplomazia, la diplomazia parallela che è fatta dalla difesa alla diplomazia del comparto dell'intelligence va rimodulato a secondo di quelle che saranno le prospettive immediate di necessità del paese. What has changed is firstly the context moving from national interests with the territorial boundaries to a new one in which the context of internet and information and communication technologies require transnational focus. The second thing that has changed is related to the assets. National security is not just about physical assets anymore, but it also requires to focus on the non-physical and intangible ones. Italy is central in the context of the Mediterranean, thus it's not necessarily active as it should. And the context in the Ukraine uh, area requires a new understanding of the meaning of security and collaboration. Alliances are crucial. NATO is moving from the idea of a military alliance to a political one. Colin MacArthur is a young professor at Università Bocconi. Colin, can you please sum up the key changes and issues and trends about state security and cyber war in today's environment? We see state cybersecurity changing in a number of ways, and I think I'd summarize it as changing along three dimensions. De- the definition of what state cybersecurity is, the principles that countries are following as they create cybersecurity strategies, and then how countries measure what success means. So starting with the definitions, traditionally, security both in the physical and in the cyber world, was about protecting assets. So the goal of these security strategies was to prevent breaches, to prevent people from breaking in. And you know you're secure if your borders are intact. Now, of course, the internet really challenges that. You know, the borders are often uh, different and available in different places, appearing in, in different angles than countries expect. But beyond that, You know, the the definition of security on the internet is also coming to encompass things like what values people can express on the internet. So what kinds of people and voices and organizations are present and able to produce value on the internet. And that moves beyond simply protecting a border. That's a broader definition of security that I think we see a number of states starting to advance. With that comes this concept of a sustainable cyber secure internet. So not just do we want an internet that allows nation states to maintain some kind of boundaries and spaces that are 
uh, effective and protected for certain kinds of expression. But also, uh, we want that to be economically sustainable. We want that to be something that countries can see all of the actors in the internet continuing to do over time. So the definition of security when it comes to the internet is getting broader. So that requires new principles of strategy and new ways of advancing cybersecurity on the internet. You know, I think there's a lot of thought about how to protect computers, about how to configure computers and internet infrastructure to prevent attacks. And, you know, those kind of protection of, of assets will continue to be important. But I think what we also see is a recognition that governments also need to think about the layers up from that. So about layers of international and national governance around the internet, how those include all the people you need in order to establish and create more freedoms, uh, how those include all of the private as well as public stakeholders, uh, and sometimes all of the actors in between. And really, this also brings a new form of diplomacy, right? So no longer is it just important for countries to be speaking between themselves about the internet and about these security issues. They also need to be speaking with other actors, right? So we see the advent of uh, embassies that have relationships with people in Silicon Valley, as well as in nation capitals. So we have these new principles aiding a broader definition. And in the end, I think we're starting to see states also measure success differently. So that means that it's not just about how many attacks did your cybersecurity strategy prevent. It's also about how many people did you enable to interact with the internet, to engage with a global community on the internet? What were they able to do? How economically sustainable was that? And so Overall, I think you just see the definitions, the principles, and the key success indicators broadening. And with that broadening comes an increased role for non-technical expertise in cyber strategies and articulating the future of the internet. I think that many of these problems are not simply technical problems. Many of these problems involve people who are good at thinking about how humans work together and how we can best build governance structures and strategies that advance values beyond just protecting infrastructure. Thank you to our guests. And thank you to the audience for listening to this podcast.